Okay, five o'clock show. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, Think Tech Tech Talks. We're talking about Microsoft uh, and how it took down election hacking software, but there's much more than just Microsoft or that software. Uh, we have Attila Suresh from uh, Silanda. I get that right, Silanda, um, and he's an expert in uh, in the risks we have in the what do you want to call it, the computer environment. But before, uh, so say hello, say hello, Attila. Hey guys, how are you doing? Okay, uh, I, I got some setting the stage comments I want to make. Okay, uh, and we have we're here in COVID time, election time. We have election hacking software. Not sure where that all comes from. We have other hacking software that's not directly related to the election. Um, we have social media disinformation that seems to be uh, in the news a lot lately, and, um, and not clear that we're getting a a real solution on that. Uh, we have software and social media that connects the skinheads and the militia who, who want to blow up the election and have violence. Um, and that comes domestically and foreign. And then of course we have the regular uh, array of, of trash mail, including an enormous amount of trash mail about the election. Um, and uh, you know, we're at an intersection here of um, you know, the regular uh, garbage and risk that comes over the internet, and then the things that come over because of COVID, the things that come over because of the election. Um, and we have, you know, both domestic and foreign players on us in this country. And so I put to you this question, Attila, <clears throat> um, like in the Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman, you know, is it safe? Uh, can we have a safe election? with the internet so handicapped and impeded this way? Or are we just gonna chase our tails and get distracted um, and disturbed and disrupted in our election because of all these factors, people taking advantage of us? You know, Congress is dysfunctional, hasn't done anything. So, <clears throat> you know, the natural question is, uh, are they gonna take advantage of us? Uh, so what's your answer to that? Is it safe? Well, the, the answer is, of course, it depends. And uh, of course, the other half of my answer is maybe. So <laughs> maybe we could have a problem. But, uh, you know, it, it's been a while since Dustin Hoffman uh, <laughs> was on the screens as a young man. But uh, definitely, uh, we do have a lot of challenges. Uh, there's a lot of uh, folks out there who uh, want to spread disinformation. In fact, I know we were talking about Microsoft earlier, but if you go to FBI's IC3, that's the Internet Complaint Center's website, uh, they have a lot of public announcements specifically related to disinformation, uh, specifically on social media related to the election. So they're trying to let the public know that there's a lot of false uh, advertising going out on social media. And, and I think that brings us back to common sense. Uh, you're going to have a lot uh, coming through social media that you don't need to believe. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as a as a pygmy elephant, and uh, there's probably no such thing as a lot of the stuff that you're you're hearing about on the uh, about the election. Now, to be fair, however, uh, election machines and systems are, or should I say, could have been vulnerable if Microsoft didn't do this takedown. So, when you're ready to talk about that, Jay, we can delve into it. Yeah. Okay. Let's delve into it. I'm all up on that one because. I worry about not only Microsoft, but any other organization that may have a, a flaw in its software uh, and that software is being used in the election and people can come and crack our system. Well, and, and that's the thing is that it's not individual users, uh, you know, phones and tablets and, and home computers that they're using to watch Netflix. Those are not the targets. We're talking about the systems that run the systems, right? The databases. The polar information, the the uh, the uh, data collectors that are in charge of, of assembling, uh, you know, uh, polar data, and uh, those systems have uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, unfortunately, new ones are being discovered all the time. Uh, but Microsoft took a bit of an initiative, and they took down what's called the TrickBot network. Now, TrickBot. Well, talk about that. What is that? Well, TrickBot is uh, think about it Think about it this way, Jay. Let's say you wanna become a cyber criminal, but your you know, security chops and your computer chops are maybe not all that great. So what can you do? You can uh, jump on the dark web, 
And uh, if we're not monitoring you, you can get through, but if we are monitoring you, we'll stop you. But uh, you can get onto the dark web. And uh, much like if you watch uh, Wreck-It Ralph, uh, Ralph wrecks the internet, Ralph goes into the dark web and, and finds a CD character and buys a virus, right? Uh, you don't need a lot of technical know-how to be able to infiltrate a system. And what happens is that TrickBot uh, gets their way inside of a, a prominent company's network, and then they'll sell access to that network for a fee. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, some local companies that we've uh, worked with, we've seen that access to the computer systems have been on the sale for dark on the dark web for anywhere from two to $3,000. So if you pay two to three thousand dollars, you too can have access to that company's network and do whatever you want. So TrickBot is a is a way for cyber criminals to be able to deliver their criminal activity as a service to anyone who's interested in in getting in access into that company's network. Mm -hmm. This sort of uh, service is uh, this is relatively new, isn't it? Well, software as a service has been around for some time, right? Uh, you're, if you don't want to do something yourself, you certainly can't hire it out. Uh, the cyber criminals just figured out a way to, to monetize the same way that everyone else has, except they're selling bad stuff. And uh, Microsoft recognized that the TrickBot uh, network was a problem, and it's a, a network of, uh, I don't know how many, but I can only assume dozens, if not hundreds of uh, servers uh, that are you know, sitting all around the world. And uh, they worked in conjunction with telecom providers to block those IPs and shut down those servers. And so that kind of whole TrickBot network was disrupted at a time right before the election when they could have had access to, um, to election machines or, or polar data machines. And uh, if, if they would have had that access and they could have disrupted, or the idea is that they, they could possibly disrupt something uh, come November. Uh, so shutting that down was a priority. And, you know, it's not to say that these guys can't rebuild their network. They, they can, they're smart enough, but it's going to take some time and it's disruptive enough at a time that's, that's pivotal to our election process where hopefully it can disrupt them enough so that they don't mess us up. And now you're probably wondering how the heck does TrickBot get onto computers in the first place? Well, how did they? Very good question. Funny so, I should ask, yeah. <laughs> you're a smart man. So uh, <clears throat> TrickBot is, uh, the, the clue is in the name, Trick, right? So an email comes in, it's got a PDF attached. Perhaps it has uh, you know, a letter from a Nigerian prince, or it could be a job, uh, job resume from someone who's applied to your company uh, seeking employment. Well. Uh, that, if an uh, HR person opens that up, it can uh, make its way onto that computer and then onto the network. And TrickBot, the way it works is that it, it, once it gets onto a computer, it just opens up a back door for all kinds of stuff. And it really depends on the industry. So let's say, for example, you're a bank and you post a few job listings uh, on, this, on your site, let's say your bank or credit union. Well, uh, then that uh, then someone, then a, a cyber criminal can look at those jobs and craft a resume that looks like something that the HR person might receive, uh, figure out the HR manager's email uh, by uh, looking at either past compromises or even scraping it off the website, send a job resume in that looks legitimate and then they open it up and sure enough, the trick bot makes its way onto that HR machine. And this, uh, this strategy has been used over and over again uh, on uh, power and utility critical infrastructure uh, companies. So they're particularly vulnerable to this method of attack. And once it's in, the payload can be very different. So for instance, if it's financial services, it can be Emotet where they're looking for card data or they're looking for financial data that they can uh, siphon out and uh, just send off to a far off place and maybe try to transfer some money out or sell those credit cards for a fee on the dark web. Uh, they could uh, go in there and just deploy ransomware straight up on a Friday night. <laughs> and when the, when the IT department isn't around, which is what they did with uh, Universal Health Services, I'm sure you heard about the biggest uh, hospital chain uh, in the country, how they were completely taken down uh, last weekend 
uh, where nobody could operate. It was over 80 locations. I mean, that's rough stuff. And they came in through TrickBot and then they delivered Ryuk ransomware, held the systems for, uh, for ransom and made it so that uh, people in this pandemic could not have access to healthcare. And that's the pretty shameful stuff. Well, the ransomware uh, is disturbing in, in the context of, um, of the election. Uh, you know, cities and counties and municipal organizations have often been the victims of ransomware. Um, and all, a, all a, uh, a bad actor would have to do is, uh, is lock down the voter, the voter uh, information and, um, and, and hold it for ransom. And now you have not only a, a ransom demand, but you also have a confidence problem because they would report it to the public, a confidence problem about, about voting information this is very troubling. And I suppose if you and I thought for a while, we could figure out a lot of other ways that you could use TrickBot to screw up an election. Um, so, you know, is it safe? Well, we'll see, is it safe? I mean, I, you say that it takes a while to recoup, you know, to reestablish uh, the TrickBot, um, you know, network, but gee, uh, it sounds to me like if these guys were motivated, they, they could do it. So, uh, you know, one, let, me, let me go, to a digression for a moment. You know, I've always felt that the legitimate users of the web since 1995 or so, when it became popular under Bill Gates, you know, um, you know don't mind revealing who they are. Get on there, whether it's a internet browsing or creating a website or whatever. You know, I, most people, most legitimate users would have no problem in, in telling you who they are, identifying themselves and having an account by which they are identified. <clears throat> but we don't have that. We have this kind of first amendment thing. And at first I'm sure you and me, we, you know, we, we thought the first amendment was good and we didn't want the government all over our, our freedom, freedom of the internet in terms of being anonymous. I don't feel that way anymore. <clears throat> I, or at least my earlier thought about it has come home. Uh, I think people ought to be anonymous. And I think you can't get on. You can't get on any network unless you identify yourself. And if you fool around, we are going to prosecute you and put you in, in the cooler for a mm -hmm. long time, felony type prosecution. And you were gonna sit there and cool your heels for a long time. And that way we will discourage this sort of thing, both on access and on uh, sanctions. But we don't have that. And, and Congress being fully aware of these problems, well, at least the, some of the staffers are fully aware, the actual Congress people don't have a clue on how Facebook works. That's my thought. Um, what we have is uh, ignorance in Congress. We have a lack of political will. We have a lack of systemic capability to actually pass any bill. And so there is no, no bill uh, that, that comes current on what is going on to deal with it. We are not dealing with it. If we dealt with it, we wouldn't have this free for all. What do you think? Well, you know, when you started talking, it reminded me of uh, China's policy about using the internet. You know, they, they do police everyone who's on there and uh, they will uh, shut you down and they want to know who you are. So I guess you have to take your battle. What's wrong with that? Well, uh, like you said, uh, they will prosecute and they also will censor. So, you know, the, the entire purpose of the internet, I, I thought, and uh, you know, that's just my opinion, of course, opinions are like armpits, everyone has them, but uh, it was, was supposed to be a free platform where all uh, expression and all uh, ideas, as long as they were uh, considered legal and uh, socially acceptable could be could be done, but- uh, haven't, haven't, we, haven't we left that, hasn't the train left that station? I mean, there's, you know, yes, it's valuable. Yes, I can do so many things. I am empowered, enabled all day long. However, the risks are much greater and the bad actors are much greater. And they are, they, it isn't safe about the election. It isn't safe about disinformation. It isn't safe about, you know, confusing hundreds of millions of people to do the wrong thing. It isn't safe about trading illicit weapons or information. Um, it isn't safe. And, and um, I think we got to bring that to a halt. 
I don't know about censorship. I don't believe in censorship, but I, but I certainly do believe you can, you can be identified and that's not a problem. It's like driving on the highway. You can drive on the highway, but it's a right, not a privilege. And the same thing, the same concept should exist with the internet. You can use it, use it all day and all night, but it is a right, not a privilege. And if you abuse it, you're done. Well, on the public internet, you might be able to do that, but on the dark web, it's a whole different story. I would shut the dark web down. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would talk to every Cisco and every network and all the hardware software, I would say, look, you got to follow these rules. Once, once a guy abuses it, he cannot get on. Once he fails to identify himself, he cannot get on. If they want to build their own, you know, infrastructure around the world and spend trillions of dollars making a parallel infrastructure, that's fine. But not the one that, you know, that we, that we permit. They can't use that. And so we, we, make, we make the system responsible. Well, what worries me really is data exfiltration. And that is, you know, how we were talking about ransomware earlier. Data exfiltration is what comes before ransomware. Everyone's focused on ransomware and how it can ruin things. Data exfiltration and data manipulation is what happens before that. Imagine if they have access to these uh, voter machines and then rather than hold them hostage, they just decide to change the numbers. Try to figure that one out. Oh yeah. Try to figure that one out. You're and scaring they, me. Yeah, they could they could take and maybe uh, release the results early, or they could uh, somehow try to post them on social media in a way that it would screw things up. So there's there's so many different angles. I mean, uh, you're you're not talking about a singular problem where you can just hit the nail on the head and you're done. This is a moving target, and we're not talking about one moving target. We're talking about billions of moving targets. And yeah. Now, beside this, beyond that, of course, there's a million different variables here. Beyond that, you have these guys are so successful. They are making billions and hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars of stock. The only, the only uh, you know, uh, successful uh, stocks, stock I issue in, in, the, in the market right now, the stock market is are the tech companies. They're making so much money and it's because of COVID. It's because of Zoom. It's because we spend all our time buying things and exchanging messages and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's just huge. And Congress has not really been able to even understand what those people are doing, much less do a trust bust on it. Um, so, I mean, I think we are way behind the curve. We are vulnerable in every which way, starting with the economic and the X, what you call it, X, X information. X, X faction? Uh, data exfiltration, yeah. Exfiltration, thank you very much. Um, and then of course, there's manipulation of political processes. We're in terrible shape on this. And, and the reason I say all this is I think it's going to visit us. We're gonna see evidence of this in the elections starting in two weeks. And we're gonna be mighty ticked off about it. And maybe if there's a functional government afterward, uh, somebody will say, gee, we had to really get into this. We had to prevent this from happening again. It's okay, Attila. You're still going to have a job. Trust me. Well, the, the, you're absolutely correct. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next few weeks? And uh, I do know, uh, you know, every time I, uh, I see Trump talking, he's talking about how uh, we may have a, a, a problem with the ballots and an untrustworthy uh, election system. So I, I don't know. It, uh, it could be a... Uh, it could be a real snafu in the next few weeks. And uh, cyber, cyber is gonna be a big part of that. Yeah, and we're in a situation where all these factors are working. It's, it's COVID, it's the election, it's Trump and his friends, it's, uh, it's Russia. Uh, you know, people think that the United States is, is vulnerable now. They're gonna you know, try games on us that they wouldn't otherwise try. I mean, I think we're, we're very vulnerable to this. And um, I'm, I'm concerned about it because I think stakes are so high and there's nobody watching the store. Really, nobody watching the store. So I suppose uh, at this point, we should probably get into your, your uh, article. And uh, I guess you made a movie about it and that's managing passwords. But what has that got to do with what we've talked about so far? 
Oh yeah, it's all connected. It's all connected. Uh, security isn't a uh, isn't just a one shot deal. It's a layered approach, and uh, there's there's different pieces you can put together of the puzzle in order to get inside of a company. So, for example, earlier I mentioned how an email to HR containing a resume, when opened, could open up a back door into that company. Right. Well, how would they get that email address in the first place? And even better, if they wanted to create trust, they could send an email from a fellow coworker referring uh, them or saying, hey, here's an invoice that needs to be paid. And that invoice has an embedded in that PDF as <laughs> a trick bot, right? So uh, that username and password that's floating around out there on the dark web, that can be reused for all kinds of malicious purposes. So. The only true way to, to save yourself, really, those two ways, is first use a unique password for every service that you use online, right? And then the second is you monitor the dark web so that if something does pop up, at least you can just change that one account. So for instance, your, uh, your password for your credit card uh, should be different than the password for your online banking. If the two are the same, guess what? One is breached, the second is breached. And uh, worse yet, if you start using that same password on your LinkedIn, on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your Instagram, you see how password reuse is a problem. And password reuse is a big, big problem. It's not a joke. Uh, what about you, my finger? What about my finger? Your finger? What about my finger? My thumb? My index finger? Oh, my, bi my, my, my bio, my biology. Well, bi biometric is good as a form of two-factor authentication. So even right now we're talking on my laptop, when I open it up, I put in a password and I also have to show my face and two cameras read my face in order for me to get in. That's two-factor authentication. Doesn't necessarily have to be my finger. Uh, fingers are great. Uh, we, we've deployed two-factor authentication through fingers, but as you know, it's not perfect. If you have arthritis, it's a problem. If your fingers are wet, it's a problem. If uh, you cut your finger, which I've had happen. Uh-oh, <laughs> you better have those other fingers recorded, right? You know, just a small cut, you put a Band-Aid on it, now you can't get inside your computer. So it's not a perfect system. Um, um, but, you know, you say that you say, well, I got to have a different password for every single thing. Right. And um, my goodness gracious, I don't know about you. Maybe you have, maybe you're really smart, but I spend an enormous amount of time every day um, screwing around with passwords. They want my password here and there, and they send it to the phone, send it to another machine. I go chase. I have to find the phone of the other machine. I got to have dual verification on everything. I mean, if I mean the amount of time that I spend, uh, you know, just to get to a payload is enormous. Surely somebody smart, maybe somebody like you, like Silanda you know, could figure out a way to bypass all of that because it is slowing down our economy among, other, among the other factors that are slowing our economy. Absolutely. Uh, password managers do this exact task. Uh, there's LastPass, there's Keeper. We prefer Keeper because it has multi-factor built in. So when I want to log in to, uh, let's say my Gmail, ask me for my username and password, all I do, log in is once into my Keeper account and then from there on out, uh, it automatically puts in my username and password, and then my two-factor authentication fills it in for me also. So everything's done. Is it, is, is it safe? Safe as it's going to be. I mean, uh, they use military-grade encryption. Uh, they haven't had a breach yet, which is uh, nice. And uh, you know, they're focused on security. That's their entire business. So that I think they understand that if there was a breach, uh, that would be a breach in confidence, and then you'd probably have to move to something else. Yeah, but, after, after you lost a lot. Well, they, they are a security company, so it's in their best interest to employ the best practices they can. No one's going to guarantee you everything, but I can guarantee you this. Uh, Post-it notes with passwords on them, it's not going to cut it. What about and, a little book, a little book that I can write in, like a little notebook, an address book where I can go through the pages A, B, C, D, E, and on M, I put Microsoft or like that. And I write it down, I write it down and I keep it in my pocket. Isn't that easier? 
it is easy. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a big time saver though. We have some clients that did that in the past and then they realized that uh, that worked for maybe one person, but in an organization where you have 10, 15, 20, 30 people, it doesn't really cut it. You have to have something that's a little bit more centralized. Not to mention, how hard is it to change a password once, uh, <laughs> once Johnny leaves, you know? Once Jay, our accountant, takes off, you know, we have to change all our passwords all over again. That's a very difficult process. Uh, also, the dark web monitoring doesn't really work either. So the idea is a lot of these password managers, especially Keeper that we use, uh, it monitors the dark web to make sure that the password, that username and password combination that you're using isn't being leaked out there. So if there's a breach on LinkedIn, I'm sure you recently, you heard about the Evite breach. Uh, all those passwords for Evite made their way out. Who knows? how many password reuses uh, are out there. But I can tell you this right now, we know which ones were reused. We're able to remediate them for our clients. We have a full dashboard into monitoring everything from them. It's a very simple problem to solve and it's very affordable. Uh, recently, we just did an article for it in the advertiser uh, just on uh, Tuesday. Uh, so uh, it, it turned out really well. And, uh, and you made a video and, and we're, and we're gonna play that. Sure. But, you know, it strikes me, take Keeper or one of the others, right? Um, it's a company. It's a, maybe a private company. I'm not so sure it's a public company. It's a company and it's a corporation. It's got a board of directors and this and that. Okay. One day, this fellow who is a kind of an oligarch, let's call him Johnny Oligarch. He comes around and he says, you know, I really like your company. I am going to buy your company. I'm going to pay twice, three, four times as much as any valuation would, would determine. And um, here's the money. Now, hand me the control of your company. And, Mr. and Johnny uh, goes back to uh, Moscow, say, for example, and he's got control of this. Um, he takes the board out. He takes the management out. And he's got all the passwords, all of your password. Um, how could, is, who's stopping that? Is there a government agency? Is there a statute? Is there anybody going to stop that? It's not how the technology works, Jay. This isn't like a, like a self-storage or something like that, where they bought the building and they can just go inside of each storage locker and pick out whatever's in there. Uh, the way secure, password security works is that it's so secure that they can't even see it. There's no back door, there's none of that stuff because that'd be a violation. So the, the way it works is that if you lose your password, you are S-O-L. Do not you lose your master key password. That's what's gonna give you access to all the rest of your passwords and those are all encrypted anyway. So you're, you're in good shape with these uh, service providers. At least I hope that it's gonna stay that way. So far, they've been around for some time. LastPass and Keeper are kind of like the top two. Uh, Dashlane is kind of in a close third, but uh, we've had some weird experiences with Dashlane. These companies are also within the United States, which is nice. All the data is kept within the United States. Uh, you know, that could change. You never know as they become a more global company, but they solve a real problem that we have today. So we could talk about theoretical things in the future. That's fine. You know, uh, anything's possible. But let's talk about solving the problem today that you might have of cyber criminals having access to your business's accounts, right? How do you fix that in the next 48 hours? Well, sure. That, that's the primary problem for sure. Yeah. And that's the you know if you're going to get if you're going to get hacked that's probably you know one way to stop it. But if I go back to my thing about is it safe is the election safe are all those factors that are in play about the power in the country about public opinion in the country about people being fully informed properly informed to vote uh, about um, skinheads using using social media to form up their their initiatives you know, to go to the state of Michigan, to conspire to uh, kidnap the governor of the state of Michigan. That's all social media. And there's no control on it. I mean, I, I hear what Zuckerberg is saying, but, you know, I know, I know, Attila, if you and I were in charge of preventing that sort of thing, if we controlled uh, Facebook, we could prevent it. I don't think he's preventing it the same way you and I would prevent it. And so I'm not sure that the password management is actually going to help us, save us against the kind of thing um, that will affect our, our national integrity. Well, it doesn't come in one form. Like, like I said, the security is a layered approach. 
I'm just starting with the simplest thing that everyone can do. Just, that's, the, that's really what it comes down to. This. The simplest solutions are the ones that work. You, you know, you have a fancy recipe, often, often doesn't come out as good as a, as a simple recipe. Right? You just keep it simple when it comes to security and keeping this stuff secure. And you're right. You know, we have also some leadership, which is, you know, telling these, uh, these, uh, these folks to, to stand by for orders. I mean, uh, th those kind of messages are also, we're getting mis mixed messages all the way from the top. So, um, you know, and, and you're right. Social media has been a great way for these fringe groups to mobilize. But before it became popular, uh, everyone was doing this on the dark web. You think ISIS operates on social media? No, they're, they're, they're on the dark web. That's how they communicate. Um, so what's the future of it? You know, uh, I, I, I grant you that uh, password uh, management is very important and everybody should do that. And I, you know, I urge people just as you do to do that. Um, but, but what direction are we going here? Are, are we getting safer? Are we getting um, exposed more or less? Um, are the tools that are available to me as powerful as, as the tools that are available to Mr. Trickbot? Um, you know, w which way is the pendulum swinging, Attila? You know, we, we deal with a lot of companies. In fact, mostly companies. And, and those companies are, are uh, coming to us because they have these same questions. They're worried about their future and what they can do. And the, to and the answer is the tools that the hackers use, there's even better ones out there to protect you. But you know, most companies don't want to make the leap, right? Uh, and if they don't make the leap, then eventually something happens. It's just numbers. It's a numbers game. Uh, we see thousands of. Uh, we're just looking at the reports uh, right before we started filming here, Jay. And yeah, we saw thousands of attacks on company networks today that we we stopped, right? But that's because we we're we were stopping them. Imagine all those other companies that don't have us protecting them. Well, I think that's a, that's a very important point, and we're going to have to close with that because we're out of time. But um, if if you want to be safe, you've got to bring an expert in, because I don't have the time to do all this, uh, and I don't want to have anybody on my staff. Well, unless I'm a big company, um, you know, it, it's it's more efficient for me to bring somebody like you in because because like um, you know all those virus protectors, you're on it all the time. You're, you're, you're checking out the newest threat all the time. And um, I'm not sure I can afford to do that in-house. Certainly I can't do it myself. But if I hire somebody like, like Silanda or one of the others, um, then presumably I have the best protection I can have in, in these times. But let's, let's, um, let's circle back, Attila. There's more that's gonna be revealed here in the next few weeks. I'm sure you know, you're gonna make more more of your videos and maybe some more articles too. <laughs> we'll all learn something in the election. Thank you very much for joining me today, but this conversation is only beginning. <laughs> you got it, Jay. Stay safe out there. Take care.